I still do that today. And growing up, we would go to two and three family reunions uh, a year. I don't know that they do that so much anymore, but it was part of our lives. And, but as the years wore on, the people grew older and the connection of the families kind of died away. So the reunions also died away. So it was in 2006 that I hosted the last reunion for the Charles and Caroline home reunion in my home. A small group arrived and after lunch, we were discussing the little family and pictures when one of the distant cousins said that she had um, letters written by Thomas Delano Roosevelt <laughs> Nelson uh, that he had written to his wife, Lydia Jane Fury Nelson, during the Civil War. Um, she said that her, that our great grandmother had given them to her father, and he had given them to her, and she had them in a safe in South Carolina. But this was on top of the letters that, um, that her father had. It said letters of Thomas D. Nelson to his family, enlisted in 1861, taken prisoner May 6, 1865. Placed in Andersonville Rebel Prison and never heard from again. His daughter, Caroline Nelson Paul. Mary Beth said she had read these letters, but she had never taken the time to transcribe them and write down what he had said. I had never heard of these letters, and I was excited to know that they even existed. And so I talked her into sending me copies of these letters, and thus began my six year journey into the lives of Thomas. Donovan Nelson, his wife, Lydia Jane Fury Nelson, and their daughters, Frances, Eleanor, Isabel, Caroline, my great-grandmother, and Nana. After quickly reading the letters, I was hooked. I always enjoyed history, but not the dates and places and battles. I think I enjoyed the story part of it. And here was a great story, and this was part of my family. I decided I wanted to share what Thomas had to say with other members of my family. So over those next six years, I worked on transcribing and bringing his words to life. I wrote them exactly as he did, including all the misspellings and the bad grammar. I then researched what happened to his family when he did not return from Andersonville prison. When I was finished, I thought besides my family, there may be others interested in Thomas and his family experiences during the Civil War and the years following. Today I'm going to take you on a journey during the Civil War. Not your typical journey of battles and casualties, campaigns won or lost, but a journey of one man, one soldier, one father, one Civil War husband. Let's take a step back in time to August of 1861 into a small community called Plain Grove in Lawrence yeah. County, Western yeah. Pennsylvania. So, so. The Thomas is on a small yeah. farm when he hears the call for volunteers to form a regiment to fight in the Civil War. He feels strongly about the country and the abolition of slavery and decides to leave his wife, Lydia Jane, and his three daughters, age seven, five, and one, and one on the way, and heed this call. So on August 31st, 1861, Thomas goes to Harlinsburg, Pennsylvania, just south of Mercer, and the other men in the area, and they form the 100th Pennsylvania Infantry Regiment, and Thomas was assigned to Company E. The original flag was destroyed in battle, but this flag was made between 1864 and 65, and lists the battles that they engaged in, including Antietam, Fredericksburg, Vicksburg in the wilderness to name a few. General Will Winfred Scott Hancock of the Heavens of Pennsylvania decided to nickname the regiment the Roundheads. Many of these men were Scottish descendants whose ancestors were loyal to Oliver Cromwell. He led a British regiment, also called the Roundheads, against King Charles I during the English Civil War. Cromwell's 
men were called the roundheads because their hair was cut very short in contrast to the long ringlets fashionable in King Charles I court. I sometimes try to imagine what it was like for Thomas's pregnant wife, Lydia Jane, as she stood at her door with three babies, watching her husband leave her. She knows that she alone is not responsible for the care of her children, the house, the farm, the livestock, and the garden. And maybe she was behind her husband's decision to fight in this war. And I imagine she is thinking, surely it won't be long, but he will be back soon. I will be sharing with you some of Thomas's letters and pointing out a few things I found interesting. This is one of the envelopes containing one of his letters, and it says, Lydia Jane Nelson, Plain Grove, Lawrence County, Pennsylvania. A couple of the main themes that he had in his letters were, first, he talked most about letters, letters he received, letters he wrote, who he got them from. And he talked about money, like she got money from the army, but he would sometimes send her extra money. And he would tell her what he thought she should do with that money. He talked about prayer meetings that they would have every night if they could in their tents. And then just trying to describe what he saw and the people that he met and where he was. Some of this, so we're not here. Thomas and the rest of the hundred Pennsylvania go to Pittsburgh to muster in and head for Washington, D.C., where they remain from September to October of 1861. Uh, this was a Ken Burns documentary. This is when the violence would start to play. So this was his first letter. And he says, by Kim Calorama, September the 28th, Washington City, D.C., Lydia Jane, it is with pleasure that I sat down to write you a few lines to inform you that I am well, and I hope those few lines may find you all enjoying the same blessing. I received your letter on the 26th, dated the 23rd, and I'm glad to hear from you. This is pretty much how the letters were all start. But I'm hot and sorry that Bella is not well, but I hope she is well by now. That would be one of their children. The boys here for bowel complaint use vinegar and salt. It is good. I don't know that I would really want to try that, but who knows if they Thomas also describes his guard duties, how they worked, you know, four hours on, four hours off. And he explains that he hasn't gotten his uniform, his complete uniform yet. He has his boots and two pairs of socks, um, some pants and a shirt, but he is waiting for his coat. And I'm taken with how <clears throat> they got these people all in uniform in such a short time. Because there are hundreds of thousands of troops mustering now in Washington. However, this is a real boon for merchants in the area because um, Thomas's teamster told him that there were three bakers in town, each baking for 250,000 soldiers each. Thomas also relates that he is two miles from the chain bridge, which is a viaduct crossing the Potomac. This is the sixth bridge in this spot. The first bridge was a wooden covered bridge, which uh, just collapsed into the river. The second bridge was also a wooden bridge, but it burned down six months after it was completed. The third and the fourth bridges were chain suspension bridges, hence the name the chain bridge, and were taken out by floods. The fifth bridge was also made of wooden chains and lasted 12 years before it collapsed into the river. This bridge and bridge number seven were also taken up by floods. The chain bridge used in Washington, D.C. today is a uh, bridge number eight, and it has concrete and is much stronger. And hopefully it will not be taken up by flood. One interesting thing that I found when I was looking at the chain bridge was um, it was at the chain bridge on October 12th of 1861. The Union Army Balloon Corps took its first hot air balloon flight across the Potomac to Lewinsville, Virginia, where we was used to see the positions of the Confederate Army and telegraph it back to the boxers on the ground. So they were up high, they could see where the Confederate soldiers were. 
and they would use the telegraph to tell the officers below what was happening. And I wondered if Thomas would have been able to see this, but then I found he had already left for Annapolis three days earlier. I didn't know that he was born. Yeah, so yeah. on October 9th, 1861, which was exactly 160 years ago today, the Roundheads took a train from Washington, D.C. area to Annapolis. And this is how he describes that. We were 48 hours coming from Camp Hillarama to Annapolis, a distance of 42 miles, which that must have been a very slow train going. We are now in the state of Maryland, and this is a beautiful place. We have houses to live in and everything nice. They are brick buildings that General Butler took from the rebels, and they are the United States Navy school buildings. We are along facing the Chesapeake. Uh, something new for most of us was to see salt water and steamships on the sea. I like this place better than any place I have ever seen except home. So it's good to put that last part in. At this point, it seems that the Army needs to work on their food supply chain because he talks about how they have to spend their own money to get food to eat. And he was also happy because Mr. McCune had returned from Lawrence County with gifts of friends of the soldiers of socks and gloves and pound cake and apples. Mr. McCune was someone uh, who would go between the hundred Pennsylvania and back to Lawrence County because he's mentioned many times as bringing things from home and then he takes things back to their families. They stay in Annapolis until early December. When the 100th Pennsylvania joins Sherman's brigade and moves by train to Fort Reed, then arrive in Newport, South Carolina by steamer. They join in the campaign to capture Fort Walker, Fort Beauregard, and Fort Royal. We marched 10 miles to the Berry River to drag the rebels off the island, but we were disappointed when we got to the river as they were all across on the other side. They shot at us, but they did not reach us. They left all their slaves on the island, and most of all, and most all they had. It looked strange when we came to this place to see so many good houses and not a white soul in the city. Thomas also tells Lydia, about the slaves that they met in Newport, South Carolina. He was surprised to learn that one slave told them that he had 28 children. And he also enjoyed eating the hoe cakes that the slaves had made for the soldiers. He seemed to enjoy his food. The slaves say that if they are given guns, they will fight alongside the Indian soldiers. And this is the only time that Thomas tells Lydia that he lost one of his messmates. Uh, William Wilson, he was from Butler. During his time in Buford, he also talks about camp life and mail delivery and how it was delayed. The citizens of Plain Grove sent some uh, articles to the hospital there, and there was so much that the soldiers were allowed to pick and choose some of the new things that were left over. So he got a coat and um, some socks. In July of 1862, the 100th Pennsylvania moved from Newport, South Carolina to Fredericksburg, Virginia. This was a very hard time for them because this was a very Confederate city, and they are marching down the main street, and you have all the children and the mothers and the wives of the Confederate soldiers that they are hunting for. He said there were children that were crying along the side of the road because they knew that these soldiers were coming for their daddy. And they had women yelling at them from the sides of the street and young girls from the second floor of the buildings singing songs to them, rebel songs. And the soldiers told these girls that they were going to raise the American flag on this building. And the girls said that if they did, they were going to rip it down. So Thomas tells Lydia, if they rip that flag down, their whole house is going to be burned to the ground. 
Um, I included this letter today because it was the only one written on this stationery, and I like that stationery. And because I found it amusing that even during the war, people can get upset about the smallest things. As he starts this letter, I wrote to mother some time ago and told her to tell John that if he would write to me and acknowledge that he wronged me, then I would answer his letter. So I just found that. Later in this letter, Thomas tells Lydia he had sent her five dollars. She was to buy a pair of shoes for Bella, a bib and a dress and a pair of shoes for the baby, and whatever was left of this five dollars, she was to buy herself some clothes. So it's funny to think how far five dollars must have stretched back in those days. After the 100th Pennsylvania Regiment finished the battles of Groton, the second battle of Bull Run in Chantilly, Thomas writes the only letter in this set not written to Lydia. He discusses coming to Bull Run the night before the battle, and they had marched a long way and were very tired. So they decide to rest up so they can be refreshed only in the next day. However, when they arrive at Bull Run between 9 and 10 in the morning, the battle is over. He writes, Jackson had done his work and was one hour and 20 minutes ahead of us. Although the casualties were much higher, Thomas wrote that when they arrived, they found over 800 Union and Confederate soldiers lying dead or wounded on the field and three train cars on fire. What a horrific sight that must have been. And what a big loss of provisions and clothing and ammunition that were on the trains. After joining Benjamin's battery, uh, he writes that they had a hot time of then juking the grape. And I found that that means dodging the grape shot. And the grape shot was when they put shrapnel in stones and anything that would fit in those cannons and try to shoot them across. So they were dodging all this stuff coming at them. After these battles, they remain in Virginia, where they would participate in the battles of South Mountain, Antietam, and Fredericksburg. And this is a monument to the soldiers of the 100th Pennsylvania Roundheads at the Antietam National Battlefield. The next station for the 100th Pennsylvania is Covington, Kentucky. And while in Covington, they hold brigade markets um, for the soldiers, and I found these very interesting. The market lays in front of our regiment. Our field officers set the price on everything. Then there is a guard to watch that all pay for what they buy. Anyone caught paying more for any article than the fixed price was arrested and sent to the guardhouse. So I don't know why the soldier would be arrested, but that's what it says. Anyone coming uh, to the market to sell something and goes inside the market lines, whether slave or citizen, and refuses to take the fixed price for his goods, his goods are seized by the officer of the day and confiscated. There is everything bought here for sale one can think of. We pay for plate pies, 10 cents a piece. Biscuits are 10 cents a dozen. Butter is 30 cents a pound. Cheese, 20. Eggs, 15 cents a dozen. New milk, 10 cents a quart. Chickens, cooked and stocked for 25 cents. So I thought that sounded like quite the bargain. The Roundheads then moved from Kentucky to Mississippi to gear up for the Battle of Vicksburg. This is a picture of Vicksburg, but it must have been, I'm sure, before the battle. And Thomas tells Lydia how desolate this place is. He says it's hardly worth fighting for. But I think he must have been on the outskirts in a place like this. And from Thomas's letter of June 23rd, 1863, from Snyder's Bluff, Mississippi, one can get an idea of what it was like waiting to go to battle. He writes, this is the lonesomest place I ever have been at. We can hardly, or we can hear nothing here but a continual roar of cannons. We get no papers here and don't know what is going on. 
but the reps still hold Vicksburg. But Grant will take it before long. He has been planting seeds, siege guns for the last week, and report says he has got 500 guns to bear on the city. The reps have tried to fight their way out twice since we came here, but have failed. I think there will be some hard fighting done here by tomorrow or the next day. The 16th Corps marched past us last night with 80 pieces of artillery, and the 9th Corps is under marching orders for five days of rations. He also learns that at this point that Lee's army is entering Pennsylvania and heading to Gettysburg. And so he writes about that. He said, Mr. Brown got back to the regiment last Sabbath day, and Mr. Brown is their chaplain. He brought good news to the army. That was that Lee was in Pennsylvania making for Harrisburg. The general opinion of the army is that this is the best thing that could happen to us, that it would let the Northern Copperheads see what war is and will break up Lee's army. And more, he will get a good thrashing before he gets back to Virginia. Old Joe Hooker will give Lee 24 hours to cross the Potomac as McClellan gave to Jackson at the time he made the raid on Maryland. So after the victory in Vicksburg, the Roundheads marched back to Kentucky before they head on to Tennessee. Thomas is sick here and he is taken to Camp Denison in Ohio. He is so sick that one of the soldiers writes home that he has died. But he writes to Lydia to reassure her. He writes, you said in your letter that Madison Rogers wrote home that I was dead. I am worth two dead men yet, he says. I don't blame him for writing a willful lie, for there were, was a great many that thought I was dead and came back to life again. In his last letter, dated January 25th, 1864, Thomas is again at Covington Barracks, Kentucky. And he tells Lydia that most of his regiment has re enlisted, and he has decided to wait until the end of his enlistment to decide what to do. If he is still sick, he will stay in the army because the army will pay for his doctors. And if he is feeling better, then he may get out and just come home. After a furlough, the 100 Pennsylvania Rockets are back on the battlefield in May of 1864. On May 6th, during the Battle of the Wilderness, Thomas is captured and sent to Andersonville Prison and he has never heard from again. He has listed that Thomas died in September of 1864. I think it is so sad that he did all of his traveling and didn't make it to make that last segment to the end of the war. In Plain Grove, Pennsylvania, where he had lived, this is a monument in the cemetery there. And it states, erected to the memory of the men from Plain Grove and vicinity who served in the Civil War, 1861 to 1865. From these honored dead, we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. We here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. So Lydia saw her husband last in January 1864. After he was captured, she gave birth to their fifth daughter, Anna, in August of 1864. After she gets no more letters and the war is over, she also gets no more money. So she applies for pensions for her and her children. And to get these pensions, she had to have uh, soldiers from the 100th Pennsylvania write affidavits saying that they saw Thomas in Andersonville prison and that he was so sick that he never would have left that prison. And she also has to give affidavits from family members saying that yes, she was married to Thomas and yes, they were his children. And she eventually gets $8 a month for her and $3 a piece for each of her children. After receiving this pension, Lydia finds that she still cannot manage her family on her own. And she hears about schools that Pennsylvania is organizing that might help her children. 
These are called soldier boarding schools. And I had never heard of these schools and decided to learn more about them. On Thanksgiving morning in November 26, 1863, Pennsylvania Governor Andrew Curtin was at his executive mansion in Harrisburg. Preparations were being made for the big feast for Curtin and his wife and their four children. Suddenly there was a knock at the door and on the other side is a boy and a girl, dirty dress, very dirty, and they are begging for some bread. They had no one to care for them because their father had died in the Civil War and their mother had recently died. Carver could not get these children out of his mind, and he explained to friends during that dinner, Great God, is it possible that people of Pennsylvania can feast this day when the children of her soldiers who have fallen in this war beg for bread from the to war? He decided even before the war was ended that a system needed to be put in place to care for these children of the fallen soldiers. And in June of 1864, Thomas Burroughs was appointed superintendent of soldiers' orphans. Through his efforts, 46 soldiers' orphan schools were established across Pennsylvania to house and educate children from ages 6 to 16. Some used exist existing orphanages, some used old folks homes, and some buildings were built new. Some were on farms, some were in towns. Most of the students stayed to, in the schools till the age of 16, and they were called 16ers. Those who stayed until they were 18 were called scholars. Some students who left the school went on to other colleges, some got married, and some got jobs. By 1900, the enrollments had decreased, and most of the schools had been closed. In Allegheny County, there were actually five of these old soldiers' orphan schools, and one in Lawrenceville. So on January 1st of 1868, Lydia enrolls her two older daughters, Frances, age 13, and Sarah, age 11, to the Soldiers' Orphan School in Phillipsburg, in Beaver County. That town is now called Manaka. Both girls remained until they were 16 years of age. Lydia leaving to get married, and Sarah went on to attend Edinburgh State Normal School. Growing up, I had always been told that Lydia had been married and that her husband did not want uh, the younger children around, so he sent them away to school. But as I started doing my research for this book, I found in census records and on her gravestone that she was still named Lydia, um, Lydia Jane Nelson. So I figured this must have just been a story. However, while researching military records, I found that Lydia had actually been married two more times. In 1871, she married George McElrady, and after he got the pensions directed to him for the children, he arranged to have Lydia's youngest daughters, Caroline, about age eight, and Anna, six, and they went to the Mercer Soldiers Orphan Schools. The middle daughter, Isabel, stayed with Lydia and her husband. All four daughters that went to the school left at age 16. But according to the old newspaper records, their lives were anything but boring. The oldest girl, Frances, married William Randolph and lived in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, in Lawrence County. They had three children and lived a quiet life. Her husband, William, worked at the railroad and he loved to take the train up to the lake up in the port and catch turtles. He would get some pretty big ones. It was on one of these trips that he caught a large turtle, about 26 pounds, it said. And his train, when he was coming back, and it had stopped at the station to let another train pass. He had gotten out and was standing between the cars and he was leaning over to show someone the turtle when the train lurched and he fell, and the train ran over him across his shoulder. William was carried home, but before he died, he asked that his mother be allowed to visit him. And you would think this would be an easier request, but this was kind of questionable if this could be accomplished. 
because at the same time that he fell from the train, his mother was in court and she was being convicted of trying to hire someone to kill the president of the Post National Bank in Newcastle. She was finally given permission, but William passed it before she reached him. Francis and William's oldest son, Shannon, led a hard life and grew up well known to the police at Newcastle for his drinking, his stealing, and his fighting. This could stem from an incident from his youth. When Shannon was 11 years old, he was out playing with some of his friends. And an older boy came to them. He had just bought a gun for 75 cents at the local store, and he was trying to show off with this gun. So he shot at a duck in the lake, and he missed. And when the children started laughing, he pointed his gun at the head of a six-year-old friend of Shannon's and pulled the trigger. That would be tragic for anyone to see, but of course in those days there was no treatment for trauma. And I think this was a big reason that Shannon did a lot of his drinking and fighting. Their second daughter is named was Ella. And she grew up to be the only woman butcher in the United States at that time. She won a $10 gold piece in a contest in Pittsburgh, competing against 12 men. She claimed in this article that the first 10 years were the hardest. After that, one seldom cuts one's fingers. But that's good to know. Thomas and Lydia's second daughter, Sarah Eleanor, went on to get a teaching degree from Edinburgh State Normal School. And actually, she taught for a while at the Mercer Soldiers Orphan School where her sisters attended. She married William McElvain, an attorney, and lived in Finley, Ohio. She and William had two daughters. However, they were only age four and two when their mother died in childbirth. Their third daughter, Isabel, was the only daughter not to go to the Soldiers Orphan Schools. I found in family records that it said she had a uh, bad heart, so she might not have been well enough to go. And the 1880 census shows her living with her mother, Lydia, and Lydia's second husband. It also shows that Isabel was having two children at this point. The census lists Isabel as George Malcolm Brady's stepdaughter, but her children were listed as his nieces. I assume that was to protect her reputation. Isabel eventually marries Horatio Rash Caldwell. Caldwell. Rash turns out to be a very good thing for him. Their tranquil marriage is ended with these headlines. It says in Steubenville, Ohio, Steubenville is treated to a sensational murder in which Horatio Caldwell shot and killed Amos Fleas, alias Turkey. After a night of drinking, Rash and his friend Turkey Wings go to Rash's house. Uh, Rash falls asleep and Turkey tries to assault Isabel. Uh, she fights him off and he goes home. But in the morning, which happened to be Easter Sunday morning, she tells her husband what happened and showed the bruises on her body. When Rash finds this out, he steals a gun from his neighbor's house and goes hunting for Turkey leaves, and he finds him and he shoots him dead. Of course, he goes to jail. And it's unclear what happens to Isabel between this time and when she passes away. She is buried in Wellsville, Ohio, where her youngest sister and her mother lived at the time. Caroline Nelson, Thomas and Lydia's fourth daughter, was only two and a half when her father visited for the last time. After leaving the soldiers' orphan schools, she met, she met her future husband, Charles Cook when she was a servant. They were married for over 60 years and lived in the Titusville area for all of their married life. And this is them at their home that Charles built for her and they lived in there for over 40 years. Of the 11 children born to Charles and Carrie Long, only six lived to adulthood, one being their youngest daughter, Iris, who was my grandmother. Thomas never saw his youngest daughter, Anna, and it was not clear if he even knew when she was born. In fact, it, I didn't even know about Anna until I was 
pretty much done with this transcription. She was never mentioned in my letters. He ended the letters before she was born, but the letters that I had. In reading through Lydia's obituary, I found that she lived with her daughter in Wellsville, Ohio, a Mrs. L.D. Miller, which is so irritating for people when you're doing research that they never listed the wife's first name. And I wondered which daughter this was, so I started looking, and I finally found a census that had her name as Anna. But I was still confused because none of the girls had Anna as a first or a second name. Then I found another family papers that had that Lydia had five daughters and that Anna was in fact her youngest. Also in looking at the 1880 census, I found Anna at the Soldiers Orphan School in Mercer. So I went to the Mercer Historical Society and Bill Filson, the director at the time, brought out some boxes of information from the Soldiers Orphan School. He had two boxes. So we started getting through these boxes. And in a few minutes, he said, here she is. And he gives me this top, uh, this top uh, paper. It's all like scrapbooks. And here, right here, is my great aunt Anna, her great great aunt Anna. And I thought, here I am holding her picture, and I didn't even know she existed two weeks ago. While not all the soldiers' work schools were great places to live, Mercer must have been a very good school because the alumni formed the Six Teamers Club in 1891 and held annual reunions in Mercer. These were large weekend affairs, not one dinner. And they elected officers and had programs. And this is a program called um, oh, this, this is the program from 1933 the 42nd annual reunion. And these are some of the officers. This is Anna here. And this is the woman in the middle here, um, Nellie, who had collected all these things. And she collected newspaper articles of people that were in this group and um, they also made decorations. This was, this was a picture of the school. This is a poem that somebody wrote. And this, they said, was a picture of their beloved teacher. So they really must have liked this woman. They also did address books. And I found it interesting that in Anna's case, her address moved from Wellsville, Ohio, to Fort Wayne, Indiana, to Coral Gables, Florida, and then to Miami. But my great grandmother, uh, Caroline, was always in private school, private school, private school, private school. So she didn't live there. At their 35th reunion in 1926, the six teeners placed a plaque in memory of the Mercer Soldiers Orphan School on the Mercer County Courthouse, and it is still there today on the north side of the courthouse. And that plaque says, in memory of the Mercer Soldiers Orphan School, Mercer, Pennsylvania, opened in 1868, closed in 1898. Maintained by the state of Pennsylvania for the purpose of providing a home and education for the children of her soldiers and sailors who served during the Civil War. This tablet is placed by the 16ers Association of Mercer Soldiers Orphan School at our 35th reunion held at Mercer, Pennsylvania, August the 12th of 1926. In 1895, Anna Mary Lorenzo Miller. And these are pictures from Wellsville, Ohio. In Wellsville, uh, they ran a grocery store and a meat market. And I had the address for this store, so I decided to go out and, and um, we were looking for it. So we found the street and we were walking down. And the first door was said that it was 106. The next one said 108. However, I was looking for 110. And the next section was just a bare lot. And I thought, I came all this way and I can't find the building. But I had a feeling to go across the street. So I went across and went back. And up, um, up on here, it said L.D. Miller, 1901. So I knew then that this building was where my great great aunt Anna had lived, and also where my great grandmother, Lydia Nelson, had lived. And she was there when she passed away. 
They also purchased the Metropole Hotel, uh, which is this one. And her husband was arrested many times for liquor law violations. And one time he was brought before the judge for having his establishment open on a Sunday and for scrubbing out and running the filthy water over the sidewalk and into the gutter. After Lorenzo and Anna retired to Florida, Anna became an early member of the Daughters of the Union Veterans of the Civil War. She served as president, she was treasurer, and she held many um, parties in her home. And this was the Cornelia Boyd turning 10th on her grade. I often feel that there may be even a second set of letters because when Lydia died, she had two daughters who were still living. And my great grandmother had gone down to see her. I figured if she had letters, she would have split them between the two girls. We yeah, had these are letters from my great uh, grandmother. But Anna had no children to give her letters to. And I felt that she possibly had given them to this organization, but I had contacted them and talked to many people. And nobody was able to find anything for me. But who knows, they may pop up someday. That would be exciting. Um, so, in closing, I just want to say in writing this book, it became very evident to me that no matter what war, when that soldier walks out the door towards the battle, their life and the lives of everyone around them changes forever. The soldier must adjust to life in a strange place, doing things he never thought he would do. And their families must adjust to life without their spouse, parent, or child for a short time, or in this case, forever. How the lives of Lydia, Francis, Sarah, Belle, Carrie, and Anna would have been different if Thomas had returned to the same world. Thank you. If anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. And after we finish questions, we'll do the uh, wrap up. Um, when it changed to Manaka, I'm not sure. I should look that up. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, repeat the question as they're asked so the people want to find Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure when it changed that name. Uh, I just found that. I want to go again. Did you say what the founding letter began this whole Two thousand six is when I had that reunion that um, that Mary Beth had come to. So, it, and it took a while for me to get the letters. Probably another year after that. So, um, but I worked on it a good six years, and I did take some time off to try to find another set of letters because I contacted. Um, the Daughters of the Union Veterans of the Civil War, and I contacted um, historical societies in Florida where she lived, where Anna lived last, and a couple other places, and I, I tried to find everybody who could come up with anything. So then I decided to just forget that, and just go with what I had. Thanks. I enjoyed very much what you said, when you finished the game. Wow, it's such a funny moment, you know, so <laughs> you all just think about that. I'd be grateful to the Yes. Yeah, your emotions are picked up. I know. And now you said that you were people who were You like to think that a lot of them felt like a lot of reasons for the love of God because it's fascinating when you find those individuals that are a lot of different things. Unfortunately, nobody does. Yeah. 
got, yeah. It was, it was tough reading me some of these letters. Oh, yeah. I wish I could go back and ask them questions. I do wish I could go back and ask them questions. And I do wish if there was another set of letters that I could find them because there were big holes in, in these letters. And so I think, and I even called Andersonville to see if by chance there were letters from Lydia to him. I thought that would be excellent to provide them to. But, yeah, I was told that if they had anything like that, they would have been burned and destroyed when they came to camp. So um, that would be really, really interesting. Thank you. Oh, thank you.